There we to get to get that in so <laughs> Jim didn't know about that by the way so that's very very good right um okay Yes, it was then. 4.05. Yep. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, great. Okay. Excellent. Right. Um, Jim, obviously very, very familiar to everybody here, as you can see by the fact that the place is absolutely packed out. Um, I don't know what other people think, but I think to, uh, this year has been absolutely fantastic. Um, sporadic E-wise on, on the lower bands anyway. Uh, two metres maybe not uh, not so much, but um, I think we hopefully we might get some uh, really good uh, information from Jim this afternoon. So take it away, Jim. Sporadic E, is it any clearer? I wonder. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the answer is no, and my work is done. <laughs> Uh, w w one of the things about sporadic E, which, uh, apologies if some of this is just a recap of, of bits that you've heard before, but I'm conscious of the fact we've got a lot of new licensees into the hobby. And, and I think it's important that with complex things, like in most things in life, that you take a time to step back and just cover the fundy modes a little bit as well. So there's the first quarter of an hour is going to be looking at some of the, the, the problem areas that we wrestle with in trying to describe sporadic E, because sporadic E is not a simple thing, uh, and I am not clever enough to sort it out by any means, but I do have one foot in a propagation camp and one foot in a meteorological camp, and that gives me a slight insight that perhaps some others not in those two camps might not get. So this is a way of joining things together. So the short answer is I don't think it's any clearer, but we know perhaps rather more about where we should be looking and we know the sort of tools, perhaps, that might help us get a bit further with it. So, so because, as you know, I do only talk for two minutes, this could work very well, or it could not work very well, and it's working. So, so we're going to do four sections. We're going to do a little bit of a primer, which is mainly for those new licensees or those of you who kind of have lost the plot with sporadic E because you hear us all burbling on about so many different things. It's to do with this and it's to do with that and it's to do with the other. And, and actually, it's to do with all of those things, which is why it's such a complex issue to resolve. Then a couple of new things which have occurred to me in the last year. Um, a look back at two or three examples of this season and then some words about the development, development of a website which I'm working on to try and uh, make those indicators more visible to you. So that's, that's how we're going to run through it. And, and actually, the whole talk, this is the slide. This is it. That's all there is to it. So, so, so the problem with sporadic E is that if you put together all of the folklore about it and a lot of the science, and it is a mix of the two, uh, and the amateur community, we're very good at coming up with experiences based on one or two openings that we experienced and converting those into a generic rule that applies to everybody. And then we get a little bit upset and surprised when it doesn't actually work for everybody. Because, as you can see from this, if all of this is going on and becomes part of it, then actually you're never going to be able to get all of the answers at any one time to come up with a definitive, yes, it's happening today because of... But what I've found in the last several years since I've been tinkering with this, and it goes back to the late 80s, I've found that this represents the areas 
where there's interest and where there's the possibility of gaining some advantage on the bands. And, and I've said this before at talks I've done, it's a bit like when you go fishing and you first start learning how to fish or your father takes you down the river and you cast in and you don't, you don't catch any fish and you don't understand why because you don't understand fish. So this is all about understanding fish. And, and if you can understand what makes it happen, then you'll be casting in the right bit of the river. So just as a recap, here we go. So, so there's a lot of talk about how weather affects sporadic E. And weather consists in general in the stories of mountain waves, jet streams, upper ridge patterns, and thunderstorms. And I'm sure that you've heard all of those things mentioned in the context of sporadic E. And they can all be contributors. And they're contributors because, as meteorological features, not an easy thing to say after you've been in the bar, but meteorological features, that's why we all say we work for the Met Office. You know, we just can't, <laughs> we can't, we can't do the big long words. So um, meteorological features like these are very good for generating turbulence, which this stands for atmospheric gravity waves. So it's a wave motion in the atmosphere that can propagate up to great altitudes. So that's the fundamental mechanism. Because otherwise, you'd be scratching your heads and thinking, well, how on earth? There's this bloke, he's just talking about weather because that's what he does. And how on earth can that affect something up here, which is 110 kilometers? And the troposphere is down below 10 kilometers, typically. So, so what's going on here? Well, it's this, this is the communication that works between the two. And these gravity waves have to propagate up through things that change. One of the things that changes, may or may not be important, is the stratospheric winds. And the pattern in the stratosphere changes dramatically from summer to winter. Now, that may be to do with something else, but it may have an impact. I don't think it's the primary reason, but it is something that we can use as a proxy for measuring when it's changed over. And then we get up here to where the ease is, and the ease seems to, the big component is wind shear contribution to sporadic E. And then you have ingredients for meteors, the K index, and semi-diurnal tides. So... The semi-diurnal tide bit, we'll talk, well, we'll talk about all of these things, so let's whiz through a couple of these. So jet streams and upper ridge patterns. So if you look on an upper air chart, a bit like the isobar map you see on the television, you'll see currents of strong winds, and the new graphics have been really good at showing us how these jet streams meander across the northern hemisphere and across the Atlantic, and the pattern as the troughs and ridges propagate, sorry, it's coming from the west, so it's coming from over here, as they propagate across, they will carry the load and the associated ridges and highs with them and the weather systems that, that we'll know and expect or perhaps don't expect sometimes. So, so jet streams have cores where the wind is blowing very much stronger. At the end of the arrow, they have what we call an exit of a jet stream and at the entrance, we have the entrance of a jet stream and these are points where the air is accelerating into this current of strong flow and decelerating at the end. And these sudden accelerations and decelerations are also good ways of generating turbulence in the atmosphere that could generate wave motions that propagate vertically. And then a ridge pattern, this shape change here, where the red dotted line is, this is something which also is highly regarded in, in meteorology as a place where you'd be telling aircraft to expect a lot of clear air turbulence because on the axis of a sharp upper ridge, you do tend to find a lot of clear air turbulence where you get this sudden change of direction. And it is a form of wind shear. But this, don't, don't, you have to really force yourselves not to say this is the wind shear that makes sporadic E. I mean, it does, it's just a chicken and egg thing. It contributes to the gravity waves, but the actual wind shear theory of sporadic E is up there at the top. This wind shear on, the, on, on this and on the jet streams is what causes the gravity waves, this wave motion that goes up through. So th we've done that. Now then we have mountain waves, and you can imagine how strong flows of wind over a mountain range would cause the air to rise over it and come down the other side. In some parts of the world, you get these tremendously wonderful examples of lenticular cloud, where that cloud is actually stationary over the hill. And, and I'm a flatlander from the fens of East Anglia, so I don't know about hills. Uh, we get quite proud of Ely, which is on a hill that's 90 metres high. <laughs> So, so when you're on the island, you, you're very grateful. But um, mountain waves, which happen in, in other parts of the country, you folk will have seen these sorts of clouds, where the air flows in on one side, and as it goes up, 
it cools and the moisture condenses, makes the cloud, and as the flow comes down on the other side, the moisture, it evaporates and you get the clear air and, and a bit of warming. And you, you can, on the, uh, the reverse, the lee side of these hilly bits, get some quite big temperature rises, the fern effect you've probably heard called. So parts of eastern Scotland do very well, and that's probably why they grow Tabris on the Tay side, you know, things like that. So, so anyway, um, mountains turn out to be in a good place for us because from the UK, mountain ranges happen to be at quite a nice distance for our sporadic e patches to form. And if you're going to have jet streams uh, interacting with mountain ranges, that turns out to be quite a fortuitous thing for us. Uh, so you then have thunderstorms which crop up, and big ones are very, very big. And they're also very, very horrid if you're inside them. But you can see this flat top, the anvil part of a thundercloud. The, the anvil is a stable layer at the top of the atmosphere. So it's, it's what we call the tropopause. It's the very upper limit of the weather part. But with a strong updraft in a thunderstorm, this bit here is where the air is rising quickly. You can see it punches through that stable layer. And this is looking down on some that are forming, in this case, over Turkey. Uh, we don't get that many really mega severe thunderstorms in our part of Europe. You get some, but they're quite rare. But when you do get them, if they were to be this big or some of these, the vertical flow of air in the updraft in a thunderstorm is incredible. It's like 100 miles an hour going straight up. You know, this is, this is quite a current of air. So when that reaches a stable layer at the top of the atmosphere, that will, that will cause all sorts of inst instability problems. And when you look at time lapses of infrared satellite sequences of the tops of these things, you'll see there's all sorts of ripples spreading out from the tops of these, these anvils. And you can see that gravity wave motion sort of being generated. Anyway, it's quite reasonable to think that they might be quite good for sporadic E in that case, if they're doing all that business. But we've got this huge gap to fill. And it's all to do with the linking uh, items, which are atmospheric gravity waves. They're not changes in gravity. They're just waves where gravity is the restoring force, like a wave on the surface of the sea. So you disturb something and make it go up, and gravity will bring it down. So it sets up an undulation. And if the conditions are right, you'll get a wave motion. So gravity waves, in this instance, are very good for us because they form a link and they can go all the way up into the upper parts of our atmosphere and indeed into the ionosphere. So uh, this is a vapor trail from a rocket launch. Now, the rocket didn't go do lally and go all over the place as it went up. It actually was a proper trajectory, but the difference in the winds as it went up through these different layers caused marked changes in direction of the dispersal of the plume. And that's one of the characteristics of gravity waves when they get up to the uh, top of the atmosphere. These are things that you may have been lucky enough to see, uh, noctilucent clouds in the summer months low down on the northern horizon. And the one thing that they're useful for is telling you that gravity waves do at least get up that high. This wave motion is probably caused in, in many instances by things in the troposphere, the bit where the weather lives. So th these are at about 85 kilometers up. So we're getting there. We're getting very nearly up to the E region. And there's no reason to think that you wouldn't get wave motion uh, because of these things going on much higher. And indeed, you can measure it. So that's the communication. Then we come to this, how effectively it goes up. This is a, a thing about stratospheric flow. Here is a, th this quite a complicated graph. So just bear with me on this one. Time goes down here. So it starts at the top on the 16th of May and ends up on the 10th of October. The equator is this side of the diagram, and the North Pole is this side of the diagram. So we are sort of in here, in the middle, where this red line is. Blue is an easterly wind in the stratosphere, and br brownish color, uh, sorry, westerly wind in the stratosphere, and um, uh, brown. Uh, sorry, brown is the westerly, blue is the easterly. Let's get this right. Uh, the, the people who published these changed the colors uh, about five years ago, and I'm still going back to the time when they were the other way around. Anyway, the point is, at our latitudes, it changes roughly the middle of May from a winter westerly. You get these very strong westerlies around the North Pole 
to a slack flow in the sun. This is a zonal average. So it's averaged over a latitude band around the northern hemisphere. So, so here we have something that if I showed you all the way up here through the winter, it would be all very headbanging uh, westerly. The equator is a strong easterly, but it changes every couple of years, and that also becomes a westerly. This is complicated, but this bit is fairly repeatable. Every year, this zonal flow changes from a westerly in the winter months around about the middle or early part of May, and it reverts back to its winter pattern, starting sometimes in the middle of August at northern latitudes and progressively at the more southern latitudes. So in terms of the sporadic E region through which these gravity waves propagate uh, to get to it, um, in our latitudes where we're dealing with sporadic E, those waves are passing through during the summer months when the stratosphere is a weak easterly. May or may not be the interesting part of this because the stratospheric winds are in themselves a symptom of the warming of the northern hemisphere. That changes the circulation pattern. So it could just be another way of measuring how much the northern hemisphere has changed in terms of its thermal properties as we go into summer. So it could be a response to seasonal heating, but it could also be another way of saying we now got the conditions where if the heating is enough, then this semi-diurnal tide will be a bit stronger the tide that we need to be dealing with up in the E region. So it's a useful guide. I can give you links to this website. It's on the Japanese Meteorological um, Association's website, and, and they publish this. It's updated every three or four days, so you can see how this changes, and you can see when you're... And, and nearly every year, within a day or two, you can start and finish the sporadic E season with that changeover. And here's an interesting example of what happens when you have a winter period. Here are these strong westerlies in the brownie-orange colours. And look at these sudden blips of easterly going on here. And these are to do with sudden stratospheric warmings, which got into the news. They were the, they were the forecast reversals of the wind in the stratosphere that, that meteorologists look for about one in three winters will give you a really good example of this. And it's when you get such a tight vortex in the polar stratosphere that it's whizzing round that it actually becomes unstable in, in the sense that it breaks up. And like a, a cell dividing, you can get bits in the stratosphere which uh, the temperature changes by 45 degrees Celsius in 24 hours because of this disruption of this smooth rotating polar vortex. And what it does, it alters the pattern. Now, it does occur to me that on some occasions, these, co these correlate pretty well with these unusually strong out-of-season winter ease events. And it's worth keeping a look on those sudden stratospheric warming maps to see whether you're likely to get a better chance of getting some ease out of season. There's never a non-season freeze, by the way, but, you know. Um, they, these are sometimes quite good guides. This, this, in effect, this sort of thing is beast from the east material. You remember beast from the east. Well, the thing about the stratosphere and the models is you can predict when these things are going to disrupt. Usually you get about two weeks of, of heads up that the pattern's going to disrupt. And we were all saying, well, there's going to be a cold spell coming, people. You know, I said, whoa. I haven't had a cold winter in years. Anyway, this thing, two weeks' notice, cold, cold beast from the east jobby, because it takes two weeks for this to disrupt from the models first picking it up, and then another two weeks for this disruption in the stratosphere to propagate down and give a blocked pattern or an easterly pattern at the surface, and hence the return of cold, proper winter weather. And, that, and that's, um, that's how the beast of the east came about. So, sporadic E... Here's your next, you know, red sky at night, shepherd's delight. Uh, sporadic E in the middle of winter, chop more wood, you know. Get, <laughs> get, get, get ready for the next cold spell because you could, you could on a good season make that link and find that it works, but it won't work all the time. Anyway, semi-diurnal tides, this heating. When the sun rotates, of course, um, a different bit of the planet is facing the sun and the atmosphere is getting heated. So it turns out that in mid-latitudes, it's not the diurnal tide. T tides are things that change with the rotation. So, so the fact it's a tide doesn't mean it has to be water. It, it's change in temperatures. And the semi-diurnal tide um, produces a change in temperature, which is slightly stronger in mid-latitudes um, uh, as, as a semi-diurnal component. 
And it may well be that that has something to do with why you get the two periods in the day when sporadic E is more likely, that the tidal wind flow is one of the things that the weather bits modulate as these gravity waves propagate upwards. So th the way I describe it is, you know when you, if you go to Western Scotland and you're standing on the side of a sea lock and the, the tide's rushing in this narrow inlet, you'll see all sorts of standing waves set up on the surface of the water as it floods into the lock. And then when the tide turns and it all stops flowing, it's calm because you're not seeing that wave motion. And then when it goes back the other way, you get the wave motion again. So think of, think of these in a, in a very subjective way that these semi-diurnal tidal signatures alter that flow um, giving you two periods in the day when we're operating when there's something to modulate with the weather bits from down below. That's how I interpret it. But, but we'll have a look and see how that works. So these gravity waves, when they get up as far as the... Um, have I done two minutes yet? I've done one and a half, haven't I? Um, so anyway, so, so the, the signature of these things is that when these gravity waves get up there and modulate the semi-diurnal tide, what they're doing is, at, in a vertical orientation, you can get, because of this feature, you can get winds blowing in one direction at one height and in the opposite direction at another height. Now, if we say that sporadic E layers are to do with intense ionization that's focused together, that may already be up there, and the idea is from rocket soundings that people have done, that, that sporadic E clouds are composed of debris from meteors that burn up. So that stuff lasts quite a long while compared to the normal gases up there in the E region that get ionized by the sun's radiation, the UV, and that recombines quite quickly. So it's not ionized for long enough to be affected. But the meteor debris is long-lasting ionization. So this, this counter-directional wind flow, if you're moving a charged particle through a magnetic field, it will be deflected. So you will deflect the ionization down in one layer and up in the other, and you can get a denser layer of ionization, <coughs> which is how the sporadic E patches come about. So this, this is the wind shear theory of sporadic E, and it's the physics that most of the professional research people have had accepted as the way you make sporadic E. What is not uh, uh, very clear at the moment is, is what the individual components are that make the wind shear happen where they do and why some days are different to others. But this is the actual bit of physics that makes it happen. And of course it follows that there'll be a layer up here somewhere where the ionization is being depleted. So, so, and the other thing that happens is because of this tidal signature and the way the other atmospheric motions work up there, a layer once it's formed will descend very slowly over time. So when it first forms and becomes dense enough and you first pick it up, say at 10 metres on 28 megs, it will be at quite a height. And as the intensity increases, the, the actual layer is usually de decreasing in altitude. And when you look at the ionosons, you'll see evidence of it coming down in height. So often the longest paths, if you can get it strong enough at a high enough frequency, then your longest paths will be early on in the period because as it comes lower, the geometry says the paths won't be as long. But, but equally, the, the HF bands, you know, as it goes shorter and shorter skip, then it's a sign that the ionization is increasing. You need to switch up to the next band. The K index is the other one. We've always, well, I always thought that you tend to, and you do, you tend usually to get better ease openings for those low K index values. You can get hold of these all over the shop. It's a planetary index. So it may very well be different in one part of the hemisphere to another. So a planetary average is not necessarily a good way of looking at an individual event on one side of the globe compared to another, but it's, it's a starting point. But in this last season, there have been some very good ease openings at KPs of 0 and 1, and there's been some quite good ones even when it's been up as high as 4. And then when you get to the really bigger numbers, um, you tend to be talking more about auroral ease, and y the ionization is coming not from meteors burning up, but from auroral input and so on. So, 
So K and X is, is one of those ingredients that can feature in it, but if it changes suddenly during an opening, it may, I've seen openings that have been absolutely stonking openings, widespread openings all over the shop, and then all of a sudden just switch off, just, just like somebody's thrown a big switch. And it is usually when the K index has changed, I've seen it go from KP of one to four, and that's just shut it down completely. Now, that may, may not have been because of that. It could have been something else going on, and the KP index is just a response to it. But it's another proxy for saying, oh, well, we'd better make the most of this, because if the K's gone up to four, it may not last much longer. And then there's the other one about the meteor input. And, and this is quite interesting as well, because we, we, kn we know from measurements that sporadic E is composed of meteor debris. And when you look at this wonderful site that, that shows you the, the results of people observing meteor pings, you'll see there's quite a, a, a sequence of events in some months when things happen. And, and that's readily available from stations all around Europe where you can keep a check on things. But the point about it is you have to think of meteor debris as being like the fuel. It's like somebody coming along and delivering two sacks of coal into the, into the scuttle out the back. And that's your supply. Now, if you've got no weather triggers to use it up, it'll stay there and it won't be used and it will gradually recombine and that will be the end of it. So to say, book the first week of June off for sporadic E, which is a good valid thing to do, I might add, and a lot of people do do it. Yeah, but it, but it doesn't always work. And it doesn't always work because although you've got the fuel being delivered, if you haven't got the right weather triggers going on, it won't manifest disease necessarily. But this is why meteor debris and meteor showers does appear to work sometimes, but not all times. So, so it's another thing in the, in the list of many ingredients. And then there's something else which kind of is linked to the K index, the solar input. And, and that's another thing which I'm starting to think about because of these high K index events where, um, where there may be something more direct going on. So, so there's a lot of interesting stuff. So anyway, that's the, that's the primer. So now we're going to have a look at a couple of new things. Here's, here's one new thing I've hit upon, which is, uh, you know, we said jet streams are particularly good at um, uh, being areas where you're more likely to see ease form because of the turbulence they generate in these gravity waves. Well, associated with weather fronts, the, the tropopause, the top, you know where the top of that thundercloud was, the, the anvil top? That's the tropopause, in effect. It's the top of the weather bit. And when you get a weather front going on, it can, in some extreme cases, get folded down uh, the frontal slope because of a circulation that goes on around a weather front. And these become regions of very strong enhanced turbulence, so more so than just an ordinary jet stream. So they may be occasions when there's more likely to be turbulence and more likely to be gravity waves generated. So there's this business about trying to focus on which bit of the jet stream is the key bit because jet streams are great big long things, and, and it's not altogether clear which bit of it is doing the business. Some bits of it, you can understand where it's being distorted by a mountain range. You could understand how that might be causing wave motions. The entrance and the exit part of it, where there's all the decelerations and accelerations going on. But there is this other bit along the particularly active fronts where tropopause folding um, it's, it's becoming, a, and, and I know there's people in here who'll be aware of this and have done some work with it, but there's a lot of work going on about how to predict turbulence for the aviation industry. And the avi aviation industry is very keen to avoid these things, so um, anything that can be used to do that is good. And uh, there are some charts available now which I've been looking at which show probability of tropopause folding, so turbulence due to... And you can see along a weather front, these weather fronts stretch out for hundreds of kilometres, thousands of kilometres in some cases. There are zones, narrow zones quite often, where you've got a high probability up this top end, 85 to 100% probability of getting turbulence generated by tropopause folding. And these charts are updated continuously, and you can see what they... And sometimes thunderstorms individually will produce <laughs> signatures, which they can tell from looking at different wavelengths on satellite images where tropopause folding might be. So this is UMetsat's work, um, looking at satellite images and the different wavelengths and determining the probability of tropopause Propose folding, and that's quite a useful guide for some of these events. So, um, worth worth having a look at that one. And then the other thing, 
uh, I found a hip on this paper by some, some, some folk over in Eastern Europe and Greece, and they were looking at some activity from severe storms. You know the ones that I said, the truly severe ones, where you get these big updrafts of 100 miles an hour? Uh, the, these thunderstorms have all sorts of stuff going on, sprites firing off the top of it and all sorts of things. And they did some work where they were looking at uh, events where thunderstorms, as they passed by, they actually uh, reduced a, a pre-existing sporadic E layer. So we, we, we have in the back of our mind that thunderstorms may be good for generating gravity waves and putting it all out there and getting the thing to form. But if you then get one of these severe storms moving along underneath um, an existing sporadic E layer, there's some uh, effect they've found where here comes the storm in here. This is the height of the E's and this is the frequency of the E's and it just drops out altogether. And these are the lightning, the severe lightning flashes and, and so on. So there's a bit of interest there. There's, there's not a lot of work I've found subsequent to this. So this is very early days. But this thunderstorm malarkey, it may be a little bit of good and a little bit of bad. It's not necessarily all in the same direction. So we need to have a little think about that a bit more. It's fascinating, isn't it? All these things, just when you think you've got it nailed, you know, you think you've got 12 things, OK, we'll put that bit to rest now, we've nailed that bit, and then somebody comes up with a paper that says, no, nope, not that at all. So that's fine, but that's how it should be, because if you've observed that as users, then the chances are we all have to try and find ways of explaining it. It's no good to just accepting it and saying, oh, well, yeah, but it usually works. You can't have science, but it usually works. Science has to be something that explains all the different events. And, th and that's why amateur radio is great at this level, because it gives you the chance to get involved with stuff that the professionals are really wrestling with. You know, they are actually doing a lot of work trying to get behind it and um, see what's going on. So those are the new thoughts. 2018 season, I've done one and three quarter minutes now, so we're getting there. Um, 2018 season. Uh, now, I've heard so many counter views here, I don't know how I'm going to approach this bit, because I was going to say, seemed a bit quieter. <laughs> and the, somebody here has said, it's been a fantastic season. It, yeah. And, and I think what it is, it shows how subjective it can be. Your season is determined by what you worked. And different parts of the country can have a success one year, and another year it'll be another part of the country, just based on where the big openings occurred, geographically speaking. So, um, my feeling over in East Anglia was that there were some very good transatlantic openings. There was a lot of issue to do with that. <laughs> and that is, I think, one of the problems of doing this sort of research, that that I tend to operate exclusively down the CW end of, of six and two for these things. And everybody else was doing that. So that's why, for me, it sounded like a quiet season. But the people who were on FT8 were absolutely overwhelmed with it. And for me, in terms of getting data in and trying to analyse why the events happened where they happened, it was like, well, it was like a whiteout. You know when you see these solar satellite measurements where they're looking at the flares from the sun and the SOHO satellite, whatever, and you just, go, and you just go, that's what FT8 has done for sporadic EOBs because it's just completely overwhelmed the situation, the surface, with observations of paths. Now, they're all at a level that you can't necessarily hear on sideband or CW, but it doesn't mean they're not valuable as propagation items because they will be. But in terms of trying to nail the big events and the big steerers, they can um, confuse the issue and make it harder to see. So I'm thinking that a lot of the FT8 data I'll end up using more as a, as a volume thing and for be, uh, being able to use that to identify the peak events. Because if they're going to be around and worked, you'll be working them on FT8. And for the rest of us who are down here, then my, my glory this year was I've got a, um, an 80-metre doublet, which I use, and I can only load up to 50 watts on, on six metres before the shack catches on fire. So, so um, I'm not running a lot of power. And the 80-metre doublet, I did work down to US Virgin Islands on, on this occasion. And there were two of us who did it with an 80-metre doublet and 50 watts. So it can be done uh, without resorting to FT8. But the people who use FT8 are doing that sort of thing every day. 
pretty much. It's just amazing how much activity it does for a band. And somebody expressed it very well at the lunch table just now. And they say, well, the thing about that is, none of these things are all bad. And, and they may even be all good. But in terms of FT8, what they do, they keep the activity levels up, this person was saying. They keep the activity levels up when the band is down and, and it allows you to keep things active and let others know these frequencies are being used. And that's not a bad thing in itself if that, if that happens. But um, some people don't think it's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, that would be a view which I heard at lunchtime. And I can't tell you who said it and I won't tell John who said it either, <laughs> in particular. So... A subjective sense of mine was that I thought the USA this year did a bit better than Europe. Now, what I often do is look at Europe and USA, and quite often we tend to have much bigger widespread openings in Europe than they seem to have in the States. There were quite a few years when that happened. Now, this year I felt it had reversed a bit. And when you think if these jet stream patterns are contributing to this, it's not unreasonable, is it, that the global pattern of jet streams and how they're distributed will change with different climatic... We've had a very unusual year this year with this hot, prolonged, dry weather. So it's not surprising that our weather this year has produced a slightly different result in terms of jet streams and all those things connected with it. And maybe it was the Americans' turn to, um, to do well um, this year instead of us. So here's one. Uh, early on, 29th of April, uh, the main area, this small... See, the red ones are digital ones, uh, FT8-type jobbies, and the black ones are the traditional OBS. So it's 50-50 that early in the season, but it very quickly got overwhelmed with the, the, the red signature. So anyway, there it was, and that correlated really well with a core in this jet stream where the pattern was changing very quickly. On the charts that I produce on PropQuest, um, these jet stream patterns also have areas where the pattern is changing very rapidly for an upper air chart. And this area is a rapidly falling area of contour values. These values are like altitude lines on an ordnance survey map. And that is, a, that is a region of rapid change, and it's where you'd expect to see, uh, going into that jet stream, um, accelerations and turbulence, and that seems to be co-located with that, just putting it out there. Um, but the other thing we're putting out is how contorted the jet stream pattern is at any one time. You know, it isn't just something that you've only got one to play with in the whole of Europe. You've got loads of these things dotted around all over the shop, so it's quite difficult to get a handle on them. This, this is something I, I prepare each day during the season, between May and August, uh, inclusive. And I give a little blog uh, out sometime in the morning from work with these charts, which you can zoom in on, which say something about where I'd expect to see things. So this one was, um, this one was issued in the morning on, on uh, Monday the 4th of June, and it was a case of um, paths to EA in Spain on six metres because I'd just worked them, so I knew they were there. Uh, <laughs> this is how forecasting gets to be really easy, you see. <laughs> I am a brilliant forecaster for yesterday. I am just, <laughs> I'm just so good you wouldn't believe it. But this was written at 8.35, and I said here the other thing. I said, I, I like the look of a strong northwesterly jet stream over the Norwegian mountains. Now, all these commentaries are, are logged on the system, so you can put any date in, and you can go and have a look and see what was written. I'm, I'm not going in and changing anything. Once it's up there, it's up there. So here's the Spanish QSO in the morning across that jet stream, a tight circulation. And you don't know, this is forecast model stuff, so it's quite coarse. So you don't know whether it was this jet stream that was doing the work or this bit here. There's no real way of telling, but this is an area of turbulence and upset weather, which is very likely and often shows up when you get these sorts of paths. But look at that strong jet stream across there. So the paths in the latter part of the day were all across that strong, and a strong jet stream going across the Norwegian mountains time and time again that is your opening to the Scandinavian countries on six, when you get one of those. These are the big thunderstorms. And these colours, when you start to go in the really deep purple things, this is, this is like a very angry person. You know, this is somebody really angry. And you will get a lot of this strong upcurrent up stuff and a lot of uh, gravity wave stuff. But if the East European research has got anything to go by, 
this may be a bit of a quencher for the whole deal as well. So um, that, that'll be something that will uh, become clearer, hopefully, with more OBS. Anyway, so then we had this wonderful thing that I was so chuffed with. It was a weak signal, but the jet stream got us off to a good start here because here I am, and I was my first version was somewhere on the edge of this jet stream, and then it's sort of down to the southwest DX maps. And there are loads of other of these um, suppliers of clusters. All the clusters are equally valuable. They're just fantastic resources for anybody doing work on Sprata Key or any propagation. And, and I just happened to pick this one because I'm used to using it. But there are loads of Dave RAU's got good stuff on there. There's loads of them. Um, KST and everybody else. So, so they're, they're all incredibly valuable, and this by no means picks one out over another other than just to put something on the page. So let's have a look at our tropopause folding thing. Well, that was a whole long line of paths down there. One of the next things I want to do is to get the projections all the same. So we're putting the data onto one Google map where you can line things up properly, and that would be a big step forward. So this tropopause folding malarkey is actually showing quite a bit of promise for some of those things and, and showing when you think, well, there'd be one bit of the jet stream that's producing a great... You could get these things hopping all the way down to the Caribbean. And when you get these big, long events where you've got just about any direction you go, you've got places where you can find jet streams that might be generating the turbulence. So there's a lot of potential, shall we say. Um, so, so multiple regions. This is the last sort of detail bit. Multiple regions. Europe, USA, Atlantic, Polar. All this going on, big happening going on over here. Big jet stream going on over here. So this black box, black oval, black oval, right in the core of the jet stream as it comes down over Germany. It really, and uh, you're going to say, well, you would pick that, wouldn't you? Because it just lines up perfectly. Well, yes, I would. But, <laughs> but actually, actually, uh, nearly every time, you will get a good correlation between a jet stream and these openings. What you do find is the, the turbulence along a jet stream can be very near the edge of it. It's not, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to get to that resolution that says that bit of the jet stream is more important than that bit. Because a jet stream, and, and also, this is a forecast model field. This isn't the actual measurement. So you're still not actually measuring where the turbulence really is, but you're getting a sort of a probability of where it might be related to it. Anyway, that's kind of cool, isn't it? That, that doesn't get much closer, does it? So anyway, let's say, OK, well, if this is all working, let's see if it works for somewhere else. So let's do the Spanish paths across the Pyrenees. Well, there we go. There you have the, the next stage of this jet stream, a northerly jet stream onto the Pyrenees is a dead ringer, and, and the mountains of northern Spain. Uh, it really, the Cantabrian Mountains down along that coast there. Uh, absolute shoe-in for looking in that direction for sporadic E. So any jet stream worth its salt in the summer, anything over about 60 knots, is, is pretty much worth having to think about. So, so that's quite good as well. So that's, that's two of them done. Any others we can see here? Um, uh, North Atlantic, this thing here, well, that's got to work. Uh, well, well, and there you are, right in the jet stream on that one. So, so that one fits in. And then it's like, oh, yeah, but what about this? Look at that. That's a bit of an outlier down there across the Crimea. Well, what's going on there? Well, another jet stream going on down there. That's what's going on down there. So on one map of Europe, you've got four things which correlate with a very busy jet stream chart, but it shows how useful it can be to think about exploring those directions if you're limited to how much time you can spend in the shack before cutting the lawn and doing all those other things. So it is quite interesting. And then you have the, um, the other bit, which is, are satellite pictures as good for doing that? Well, sometimes you can't tell if the cloud isn't showing up. An infrared satellite picture would be better because that would show cirrus cloud levels and you could see where jet stream signature cirrus was. But even that is sometimes not conducive to a good answer. Now, this business about thunderstorms being the only thing you've got to think about, there are no thunderstorms in any of these bits where the ease was. I'm just saying it. Just put it out there. So, so whereas we tend to, the rule has been, the rule has been that thunderstorms are the deal. If I had to pick one thing for the deal, I would say jet streams rather than thunderstorms. And then um, if, you, if you zoom in, you just can't see these little red dots here are the thunderstorms. And, you know, 
Anyway, so that's that. So uh, the last little bit, the transatlantic paths going off here also match up with jet streams going across there. That's a path and that's a path. So no matter how many, t how many times you need to look, you know, jets, even in America, you know, jets, uh, there we are, jet streams. So 99%, well, it's not, it's about 92% of the ones I've looked at. So the last thing, just a quick look at this thing, just to say what's coming next. You're probably familiar with the FOF2 plots that I put up on PropQuest. If you haven't seen PropQuest, this is a free website which we run at WeatherQuest. And, and a, a, a colleague of mine took pity on my poor attempts at plotting these by hand. And he's written some code so we can see this, um, you know, 10 minute intervals, the latest FOF2 and things like that. And there's different skip distances, the lines above it. And the FOEs is down here. And you can see sometimes days when there's a bit of FOEs going on. This is either from Chilton, um, Fairford or, or Durb if the uh, two local ones are missing. So anyway, it, it, it's a useful thing, but it does a lot of archive stuff and you can look back at dates and you can see why your net one week wasn't as good as the week before, things like that. Somebody did say, well, why don't you get it to send me an email when the, when the <laughs> FOF2... When the FOF2 is above 7 megs, so I'll know what whip to pack to go uh, on WADB and SOTA things. And that's good as well. But that would mean then you have to take person's details and email addresses and things like that. So this is free. But anyway, there's a bit over here, which is this. That's where the Ease blog, in, blog is, those texts I spoke about. This is EPI, and this is the Ease Probability Index. So I, it's kind of something which may or may not produce results. There's your blog and that's coming soon, and that's a, an early look at where the things are and the intensities. So you can look at a point centred on your locator, and you'll be able to calculate a percentage chance of these ease indicators, all the ducks being in a line, basically. And you can alter the size of these rings if you want to do experimenting, and you can move the timeline across a bit as well. So, we've, we, so it's, a, it's a composite of loads of different things, and you can imagine with that first slide, it is a bit complicated. So it's a mix of the weather bits, the time things like seasons, time of day, the geography, the altitude of the place where the mountains are and such like, and solar parameters, KP index and things like that. And all of that could come together and give us an ease probability index. And at the moment, we're still tinkering with all sorts of values. The time zone part of it is dominant there, but you can see the magnetic equator going through there. You can see it slightly better in this one, which we've got working, which is picking out jet streams, and there's the geomagnetic equator, and there's the southern hemisphere ones. So sooner or later, we'll end up with a map and a bit more tinkering that will give you that as a, as a display of where these things might be more profitably found. And uh, there you have it. So it's still no clearer, is it, people? <laughs> Jim, thank you very much indeed. There you go. Thank you. Now, I know it's tea time, but um, just take a couple of questions only, if you want. Hello, Dick. Yep. Yep. I'm uh, Dick, PA2 Delta Whiskey, and... Uh, First of all, I'm very happy to hear that you uh, you said uh, about the meteors, that the meteors are the fuel for the uh, sporadic key. I had this theory in the 80s, and I said it's like uh, uh, a, a collection of uh, uh, nails in the atmosphere which will get rusty by ionization. Yes. Uh, st yes. Still, people say that's Dick's rusty nail theory. <laughs> <laughs> well, I shall have to add that to the and next version of it. this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, my question is... Um, um, it's I have not been uh, f thinking about sporadic key a long time, but in the 80s we had this idea about how could it be possible that at these certain time slots in the day, in the morning and in the afternoon, there's a higher chance. And we thought that it had to do with the angle of the sun going through a larger area of the atmosphere. Could mm -hmm. it be or couldn't it be? Well, it could be, of course. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I think I th be. because because the the ease is composed. The rockets have decided that ease are made up of uh, meteor debris. Yes. 
And, and therefore, the angle of the solar input, the radiation per square meter, presumably, wouldn't have such a big impact in that. Uh, the, the, the way we think that affects it, the two times, is this semi-diurnal tidal wind flow making the, e, the tidal winds interact with the gravity waves from below. So your temporal bit comes from that. In fact, there are four of these opportunities in a day, in a, in a period, when you could do it. But, but um, we haven't come up with a reason why it might be related to the solar ele elevation, other than, indirectly, that the solar elevation determines the strength of the heating over the land, which determines the magnitude of the semi-diurnal tide. Okay, so thank you very much. Yeah. Right. It's not that there's more meteor input at that time of day. I don't think so. Uh, you're uh, saying it's it not. Because it happens twice, yeah. Yeah, so it's yeah. Yeah, so no. it's actually the opposite to meteor scatter. Yeah, yeah. Where, where you just get it once in the morning. Yeah, what would be interesting, I keep forgetting the figure. There is a figure for how long people expect meteor debris to recombine. But it's a lot of sec It's many, 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 many seconds. Yeah, it's so, so it's time for this effect to take, it, take, take its course, yeah. It's all down to size. It, well, that's uh, the cup. The cup on the thing there from I'm the talk earlier on. Life. Yeah, okay. Oh, here we are. I'll jump. As an answer to John's point, there's a lot of evidence that actually there's, that this isn't anything to do with large meteorites, but micrometeorites, uh, where you don't normally see it by meteor scatter. And the papers by Jim Kennedy show very clearly smaller density stuff being moved up from the equator and then being dropped down on mid-latitude areas. And I was talking to Jim about that last night. And that does not vary too much during the day. It's almost no. constant, irrespective of what normal meteor scatter reflections give. Good. Thank you, John. Right. Um, OK, it's tea time. Uh, next one's four o'clock.